it's important to note that the operation that is being explained in this video through various forms of evidence and whatnot will present a foreign enemy operation and just like with all the other videos there might be an appearance of it being domestic or local but it is being carried out on behalf of foreign enemies and that is with the purpose of undermining the security of a free state as listed out in the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, making it, of course, easier to take over and control on behalf of those foreign interests. Now, one of the primary obstacles to this type of operation would, of course, be veterans of the armed forces, especially those that have been active duty because of training capabilities and understanding. And so here in this video, we will see what is done to eliminate this issue for the internationalist foreign enemies. Now, the first method is of course going to be targeting the opinion of others or swaying public opinion against veterans. Now, this is very difficult and tricky, considering the large number of positive views towards veterans. So what has to be done is that, using every trick out of the con man's book, the opinions have to be swayed in such a way that they're damaging to veterans, but done in a way that the individuals can pretend and feel like they're actually doing the opposite and supporting veterans. Now, there's a variety of ways to do this, but the main thing is that the attempts to swindle or trick veterans is not the objective. That's pretty much impossible. Uh, well, it's extremely difficult. Veterans, generally speaking, have particular types of training if they're true veterans, meaning they've been active duty, they've been in the actual armed forces, not some of these subsets which are anything but and just go around pretending. That's because the basic example of how it would be hard to trick a true veteran based off of the uniform when you go through active duty, when you live in the enclosed environment of the U.S. military, then you get very observant about uniforms because of following the regulations, and it is very apparent when somebody who is phony puts on a uniform. And it's the same thing with everything else. You notice mannerisms, difference in knowledge, right? They, they know things they shouldn't, or they don't know things that they should. They don't have the habits or the mannerisms that go along with it, despite perhaps doing research and being able to play the part. Now, this is not for tricking veterans. This is for tricking everyone else. And this requires, generally speaking, protected stolen valor uh, agents, essentially undercovers whose entire job is to sway the opinion of veterans by posing as them, using assumed names and other things like that. But there's many other ways that this is done, and generally speaking, through all of the forms of media available to them, they control perception against veterans, but in a way that everyone can go around pretending like they're in support of them. And of course, this has nothing to do with targeting the opinions of veterans, it has to do with targeting the opinions of everyone else. Now, the next thing that they have to do, of course, is to gain control of the assets or the mechanisms for essentially sustaining uh, somebody's lifestyle, right? And that's specifically with the veterans. They do this in a variety of ways, but most of it done under color of law with fraudulent pretense and whatnot. And then naturally, the next one is to ensure that veterans are corralled into poverty. They have difficulty moving or doing anything anywhere. They are essentially, in an organized and operational fashion, targeted as enemies of the uh, internationalist corporate system that we live under, under today, right? They, they dole out pretend benefits, which is taken from the assets that they have taken control of. And they also ensure that, that 
you can only, as a veteran, go or do anything anywhere as far as their system goes in a way that you have a tight leash and that you will never rise to a level that could challenge their position. That's what it's like when you live in occupied territory. You, in essence, as a veteran, are living in occupied territory when you go home. Because the entire region of the United States is controlled and done intentionally by domestic operatives on behalf of foreign enemy interests. Now, the last one is after you've enforced them, of course, into poverty and turn everybody's opinions against them, you subsidize weakness by essentially giving reward to those who uh, engage or admit to being weak, and you penalize those that uh, seek to present strength and independence, right? This is done in many different ways. And then naturally, you want to diminish them down so that they're no longer a threat by removing all their training by essentially reintegrating them is usually the word that they use and take away that threat that veterans pose through experience and capabilities and understanding to the position of the corrupt liars and tyrants that are operating today on behalf of our foreign enemies against everyone else. And if everyone else knew this, all of the others, right, those that are not veterans, those that who might portend to be veterans but not have the experience, training, and understanding to avoid being hoodwinked, right, every single person would drop all of this nasty disability nonsense immediately if they understood what the true purpose of it was. Damaging the defensibility, the capability, the security of the free state with the intent to kill everyone, including, of course, the first problem, which are the veterans. Now, this operation is very tricky. It's delicate and it's difficult. It can be uh, exemplified, or an example of this could be found with the attempt to fence in a bull. Right? A bull is a massive, powerful beast. Fencing it in takes very intricate and careful mechanisms, the ability to control the animal without it rampaging and breaking down your structure that you are corralling it in with to control its behavior and movement, and eventually uh, probably execute it for the purpose of gaining the meat once it has ceased to be uh, useful as a stud. Of course, another example that we could use is the proverbial well, it's not really proverbial, I suppose it's true, although I've never tried it, is the boiling a frog in hot water, where first you put it into cold or tepid room temperature water, and then you slowly heat it up to a boiling point so that the, the frog doesn't realize that it's being boiled alive. This is the same concept applied to the removal of the veteran problem. You transition them into one controlled environment into another in which that you retain the ability and eventually will dispose of them in a very meticulous and very uh, patient manner, just like boiling the frog or fencing in a bowl. Now this first example that we're going to look at for the uh, explanation of how these operations are carried out is a local event uh, scheduled for June 22nd, Country Vest Fest for Vets. Fun run, all vehicles are welcome. Now, what's interesting about this is that a fun run is a slap in the face to anybody who has been active duty, essentially, because they're always mandatory and they're never fun. <laughs> also, this is done with vehicles, apparently. It says that the fun run starts at Valor Retreat at High Rock. And here it gives a address in Rockbridge, Ohio. And it states at once all Jeeps, motorcycles, cars, trucks, and awards will be given for best decorated flags, blah, blah, blah. So this is clearly going to be a PR stunt, as well as a way to raise money by using the veteran label. Now, if you'll notice, 
there's no free or discounted entry for veterans here. And they are attempting to raise money for building two cabins that they allege will be used for veterans. So let's go ahead and look into this entity called Valor Retreat at High Rock. On their webpage, we notice that the first thing that they want to highlight is donating. And they list an address here, the same one on that flyer at Rockbridge. Now at the bottom, and of course this looks very mundane and uh, lacking all creativity, as is usually the case when it comes to these corporate type of things, especially with their fronts. It says Valley Retreat to High Rock Incorporated is recognized as a public charity and has 501c3 status. Donations to Valley Retreat to High Rock Inc. are deductible. Donors should consult their tax advisor for questions regarding deductibility, blah, blah, blah. And it has uh, about donations, privacy policy, contact us. So they're raising funds uh, in the name of veterans, but clearly they are not actually in support of veterans. Their event is a slap in the face to anybody who has actually been in the military and knows, of course, that fun runs are not fun and they are incorrectly labeled. So when we go and look at their business filings, we'll notice that their principal office is located allegedly in Chesterland, Ohio, County Galga. I don't know if that's how you say it, but it's uh, not Rockbridge. So Chesterland, Ohio is up towards the northeastern portion outside of Cleveland and Akron. Meanwhile, Rockbridge, Ohio is near to Logan in the Hocking Hills, which is down in the southeastern region of Ohio and is very far from their alleged principal office address. On this document, they have three names listed, and those are Lawrence Teichman, Russell Tadich, and Fred Von Ahn. The attorney who filled out this paperwork, or at least the statutory appointment of agent, is Scott A. Williams, Esquire. Now, interestingly enough, this event has a great deal of press or uh, marketing elements involved outside of the area that it's being held, which suggests an organizational effort showing that this is done from throughout the entire state and it is not a local outfit as they would like you to think. They present that face of being something local when in fact they're not at all. Now this uh, event is being promoted by a different organization in Fairfield County, which is in Lancaster. Now I went to this group and had some interesting experiences with the people that were running it, of which there were three. And they are promoting this event with a different poster from the one that is on their website. So let's go ahead and look at some elements there. Now this group, New Veterans Meeting, Connection West, and then there's a address there, is being presented as though it has no organizational structure or affiliation to any groups, which could be farther from the truth. The point is that the way that they're trying to promote it is in a manner to essentially get under the stigma, if you want to use one of their words, that veterans have groups. Veterans in general will distrust groups because of all of the contempt and abuses that veterans suffer at the hands of corporations and other group-like structures. And so they're trying to present this as sort of just a private, you know, non-structured meeting with no affiliations, which of course is false advertising. And this poster I found at a local mechanics shop. So there's a lot of effort to 
hide the fact that this is an organizational operation specifically to promote their interests under the name of veterans and also when I went to this group the people that were there appear to me to be those undercover actors that I referenced before those that uh, engage in what would be called stolen valor but with no fear of reprisal or consequence which would of course suggest that they're doing it with essentially protection from the bogus uh, phony government and other groups now there's some elements of this event that stuck out to me for one the individual that orchestrated it claimed to have attempted suicide. Now, anybody who's been in the military has probably had to stand suicide watch or had some or had at least have had known people who had stood suicide watch. That's not a fun thing to do. And generally speaking, most people that go on suicide watch, the instant question that you would ask would be, what are you trying to avoid? What are you trying to get out of? Right? That's pretty well known. There's a bunch of other things that sort of were signs, right? Like the biggest one, of course, is the fact that you, one veteran to another would not attempt to gain sympathy by claiming a suicide attempt. That would work with other people, but not other veterans you prize capabilities and strength not weakness and uh, self-aggrandizement showboating or the attempts to garner sympathy that's not something that would work but that would fool other people of course also one of the individuals was asking what I did and I said I'm oh well I'm doing gardening now and a bunch of other things and I also specified that you can't really make any money enough money nowadays to even afford to pay rent at most places so this person thought that I was looking for a job which I wasn't the other person said tell him as though it were some sort of secret that some kind of inside knowledge and then the other person who was older said that the Department of Corrections is hiring I mean that's laughable <laughs> I would never work at a place like that and I imagine veterans that do are in some ways ignorant and then the other theme that I've seen replicated across multiple areas and coming from multiple people is a currently regurgitated talking point about how veterans should be ashamed of what they did and now this person said that in that way that he was ashamed of what he had done didn't say what he did though or what he had to be ashamed of just simply that he was ashamed of what he did and that you're just supposed to assume that he did something bad and that being veterans means that you did bad things I've heard this talking point repeated in many places, including in Merida, from a Jehovah's Witness person who stated that we send veterans over to do bad things, but we don't uh, uh, really support them in their recovery. So that's a, a constantly repeated uh, talking point. Now, also, I did go to various other veteran groups, especially at the Ohio State University, and they have the same, essentially the same things regurgitated as this person was pretending to be. So this individual is attempting to characterize all veterans in a certain way based off himself, and the person's very belligerent, very contemptuous. And when I talked about the skills that I had or what I did, which is what the old guy asked me was, what skills do I have, what do I do? clearly thinking I'm looking for a job the other person said I'm all, I can always do cleaning but in not a non-joking manner 
Now, on the Valor Retreat website, near their board of directors, it lists more than the three people that were on the business filings. So, according to this, the backstory for Larry Tickman, or Tykeman, says Larry served in the United States Army as a second lieutenant. So, I guess he couldn't stick with it and rank up, I suppose. Second lieutenant, of course, is the lowest rank <laughs> as far as the officers go. Or the regular officers, the shinies, <clears throat> not the warrant officers. Larry wants to help his countrymen and fellow veterans by creating a peaceful retreat where combat veterans and gold star families can relax and enjoy the outdoors. He is the president of our nonprofit organization and his vision of helping our nation's defenders is drawn others to help his calling. Isn't that nice? Now we have Barbara Titus, who is not listed on the uh, business document. It says Barbara serves as vice president of Valor Retreat. She is honored to hold a position on the board of directors with the Gary Sneed Foundation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it says that she also volunteers her time as a director and the president for the GOGA Credit Union, serves with the UH Hospital Leadership Council. There's a, a mention of that location up by Cleveland. Jean Williams, with no picture this time, says was a Spec 5 of the U.S. Army and traded Fort McClellan, Alabama in February 1975 as a WAC and says she was stationed at Fort Lee, so that Jean would be a woman, apparently. And a bunch of interesting backstory for uh, probably a fictional career but he really knows, right? Now we have Arnold Killian and so far only one of the names on the filing documents listed. And it's got a quote here, freedom is never free. It says he served in the Army Reserves for 40 years. That doesn't say that he was a second lieutenant. <laughs> now, among the whole list, there's apparently one that was in the Marines, which was Charlie Brown. Hmm. Apparently, Corporal retired. Hmm. That would have to mean that he spent at least 20 years as a corporal, <laughs> which is very unlikely. Now we have Kim Braley, who manages a social media and website for the village of Middlefield and the Middlefield Police Department and serves on the community advisory board for the Idea Stream Cleveland representing Galga County. Isn't that interesting. Now on the advisory council members we have Russell Tadich who was a lieutenant. Doesn't say first or second lieutenant, just says lieutenant graduate of the Naval Academy. That's another problem with this workup. Margie Wilbur, a uh, graduate of Bowling Green and Ohio University, and just a bunch of nonsense. Now we're going to go to the business plan or Valor Retreat. And this states its extract. Now, the first page is a confidentiality agreement, which, of course, tells you that they have things that they don't want to be shared. But what's up with secrecy here? Here it states, Valor Retreat Business Plans undersigned reader acknowledges that the information provided is completely confidential. Therefore, the reader agrees not to disclose anything found in the business plan without the express written consent of the Valor Management. Yes, and that's what I'm going to do, because I don't give a crap. <laughs> It is also acknowledged by the reader that the information to be furnished in this business plan is in all aspects confidential in nature other than information that is in the public domain through other means, and that any disclosure or use of the same by the reader may cause serious harm and or damage to Valor Retreat. Hmm. Why would it cause serious harm or damage? Let's find out. Now, the first interesting anomaly that we find 
Oh, I don't think it's an anomaly at all. Is under key activities. Here it states, offering cabins for free to combat veterans, Gold Star families, and first responders for up to one week stays. So that would either be written by a person who does not comprehend the difference between a quote first responder and a combat veteran and the Gold Star families, or it's slipped in there because their real intention is to displace veterans or so-called first responders considering that those positions are designed to enforce the criminal codes of foreign adversaries. Now this is in contrast to their mission and vision where it states a valley retreat our mission is to think Ohio combat veterans by providing a place to unwind and enjoy themselves away from the stress of post-service life. This looks like it was written by a computer program because stress of and Ohio combat are unified into one word. Those are typically separate words. Also, it states, we want to help them get away and recharge in our cabins that provide beauty, one word, and comfort. We will do this by providing free housing, one word, for combat veterans, one word, looking for a perfect chance to disconnect from the rest of the world, reconnect with their families, and enjoy Mother Nature. Those are errors that you would generally find when using a computer program. There are repetitions of the same thing that you have to delete. And then of course there are unifications of words that are normally separated. So things like that generally happen when you're using a computer program. Uh, and I personally have experience with this with a language translator programs and all sorts of issues like that have to be uh, edited right that re still requires going through with a, an individual editing it and then you won't even catch all of them but this looks like it wasn't even edited it just was written up with some computer program and then set there and I, of course if you use that nonsensical term artificial intelligence so here on the introduction and background we get a understanding of the perspective behind the creators of this nonsense. Well, it's not really nonsense. It's a foreign enemy operation acting under the cover of veteran uh, assistance, basically. Well, this appears to be not written with a uh, computer program. And it's running the same usual uh, regurgitated talking points, shall we say, and requires a little bit of decoding. Suicide among combat veterans, right? Always start out with that one. Just like Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. Is a continuing concern to both the U.S. government and the citizen community. As estimated, 7,057 service members have died during military operations since 9-11. While suicides among FDD personnel and veterans of those conflicts have reached 30,177. Hmm. Where are they getting those numbers? They look very specific, which of course gives them weight to legitimacy, right? They, they look like there was some research done into it. Of course, they don't cite where they get the numbers from. That's more than four times as many. The rate of suicides among active duty service members and post-9-11 veterans is outpacing the suicide rate of the civilian population. Hmm. Right, and how would they know that? The only other time that has occurred was during the Vietnam War. Military suicide rates during previous conflicts have even been lower than those of the general population. Hmm. Yeah, right. That sounds like the uh, young 20s teenage lady at OSU when I went to a concealed carry class there who got up in front of a room full of legitimate veterans and said... 97% of veterans commit suicide. <laughs> and of course the faces of non-reaction in the whole room pretty much was a explanation of how well that was received. Nobody said anything or made any points about it. We just, you know, it was just about the same type of crap that you have to deal with everywhere. <clears throat> Anyway, a significant risk factor for the increased suicide among veterans is the difficulty of reintegration into civilian society. 
Leaving the service for civilian life is akin to immigrating to a new land. Wasn't well, that nice? So now they are associating veterans with immigrants. Your previous identity, language, habits, and history become largely irrelevant. Yeah, so the writer of this crap thinks that veterans are irrelevant. And naturally all the habits and history, language, and identity. You have to start over. Learn a new culture and establish a new identity and community. You have to do that, according to the person that wrote this. This can be highly stressful and disorienting, <clears throat> according to them. While the culture of lauds and hails as heroes, those who enlist and go to war, it tends to suspect and stigmatize those who return, viewing them as cultural others, dangerous or broken, not unlike how we regard immigrants how we regard immigrants. Without a feeling of belonging and as their struggles increase, their sense of being a burden to others, veterans may enter a downward spiral leading to depression and elevated suicide risk. So of course that ties to the perspective of the author and what their ultimate objective is. It's to suicide veterans, or at least use that as the cover for elimination by naturally making them uh, tantamount to immigrants and to ensure that there's no belonging and to increase their struggle and their sense of burden to others. Valor Retreat, a nonprofit organization, seeks to help those combat veterans, especially in Ohio, through the transition process. By offering them up to a week-long stay at our cabins in the Hawking Hills located in Logan, Ohio. Yeah, I wouldn't go there. I suspect there's a high probability that you won't walk out. We will allow them to escape their normal, hectic lives, meet with other veterans with similar concerns, and reconnect with their families, all in a quiet, natural setting, because we are a nonprofit organization. We can do this no cost to veterans. We will be serving. Yeah, sure. And I expect that no true veterans will take up that offer, because they are attempting to do this stuff in the name of veterans for ulterior motives. Here in their business plan, they have the listed locations. Valor Retreat has a 22 acre farm upon which there will, and which there is one word written by a computer program, will ultimately be eight private first class cabins to host families for up to one week. We'll begin the project with two cabins and build more as time and finances permit in, permit in one word, order to increase the number of veterans served yearly to us, the perfect way to show our gratitude to these gallant veterans for their selfless service to our country. And the rest of this pretty much continues the same way. Basically just a bunch of uh, coded garbage and uh, computer program writings that are completely full of these patterns of error. Now, I attended a author fair, if you will, at the Fairfield County District Library. Here, there was a particular individual who was attempting to sell his books, or book, which he wrote about his alleged experience as a combat veteran in Iraq. Interestingly, the guy who apparently organized the other group, who was a different person, and said that he had tried to commit suicide, attempting to garner some sort of pity or attention for it, also was allegedly an Iraq War veteran. Now this person here at this event, the author Fair, his book apparently was about how he saw a winged female angel. Sounds to me like a Valkyrie. And of course the whole stuff was full of details that could have been lifted from any Hollywood movie and was naturally designed to manipulate or I guess garner attention for, from those who had no experience and he approached me once about the fact that I had a short mention on my biography about military service in the Marine Corps. Now he said that he joined the Marine Corps in the reserves and then went active duty. Now I know you can do that in the Army 
but I am certain you cannot do that in the Marine Corps because you have to go active duty first to be in the reserves and then when you're in the reserves you're not really doing anything you don't get pay you just kind of sit there and they can call you back it's just a part of everybody's contract so stating something like that to me either he thought that I was another covert operative who was pretending or something else but either way he did not talk to me afterwards and he had no desire to either all sort of dead giveaway signs that that person is doing something that's not honest. Now, while I was at the Ohio State University, I had particular difficulty when I was in my English class, <laughs> which was anything but an English class. And the teacher, who clearly had willful and knowledgeable understanding of what was going on, had a great deal of issue with my experience-based and very well-written understanding of so-called veteran disability. Also, I used a source which was um, from the, the uh, apparently legitimate medical industry, right, people with titles and degrees and all that nonsense, talking about the use of mefloquine and how that led to post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis, when in fact it was a drug that was given, and the side effects of that drug all had the same representative outcome of so-called post-traumatic stress disorder. And I talked about a bunch of other stuff. And she didn't know how to handle me, so she did what any good uh, academician, although I, don't, I, I think Richard Mitchell's characterization of them as educationists is more applicable because they don't actually have anything to do with education they just operate under the name of education with the design to undermine the security of the free state particularly through propaganda and operations of psychological warfare so she gave me bad grades awarded arbitrary bad grades which is their go-to strategy right if you don't do what we say then we're going to give you bad grades and make so you can't graduate and of course, control your finances, because everything they do is all about control and fencing you in to make you into cattle. Here she states, the purpose of the assignment was to start making claims about how disability is represented in popular culture and then back up your own claims with secondary sources. And remember, this is an English class. Overall, you demonstrate an understanding of your secondary sources, it's spelled incorrectly, and you incorporated them into your writing with both paraphrasing and quoting, blah, blah, blah. And in the next or the bottom half of this comment, you really get what she has an issue with, which is, it seemed that your overall claim was that the media misrepresents those in the military, especially in connection with violence. This gets away from the theme of the course. Well, it wasn't the course about representations of disability in popular culture. Well, the course is supposed to be about English, but there really wasn't much about English. It was all this uh, disability operation going on. The uh, control of perception and uh, stabilization of the undermining security of the free state operation through the guise of controlling response to disability. And, of course, that label itself. This gets away from the theme of the course representations of disability in popular culture, which should be the main focus of your papers. Obviously not learning English. Toward the end of the, or learning better English anyway. Toward the end of the SSI, you did write about PTSD, but it seems that this could be a much larger part of the paper. She definitely did not like what I wrote about that. <laughs> that it was uh, mostly caused by mefloquine, according to research done by apparent doctors. For the ARP, you will want to focus on quick blah, blah, blah. And so that was a particular assignment that unfortunately I don't have access to because they controlled those mechanisms and I didn't figure out a way to save it. But I do have some other examples of work that I did in this class that particularly got under the skin of the teacher. Now also this is a person that made an assignment where we were supposed to raise awareness about disability. <laughs> 
And I said that we could all pretend to be blind for a day. And she said, how would blind people feel if they saw that? So here, under this assignment, not the same one that she's referencing now. I stated this image depicting a service member shows a common misconception about veterans. The helmet on this individual designed as a metaphor for this individual's brain shows words like trauma, depression, grief, and rage, anxiety, substance abuse, and suicide. While it is stated that there is a high level of veteran suicide, I do not how tr know how true this claim is. However, it is a common belief that veterans are just a bag of psychological issues and capable of, li of living out their own lives competently and that all of them need medical treatment. While this stereotype does help veterans gain more benefits and deserved care from governments and agencies alike, it does have its consequences. Now that statement, I wrote when I was more ignorant, and now I would never say something like that. Some of these consequences for the volatile veteran stereotype are increased difficulty in reintegration, increased difficulty in reintegration into society. That's of course an objective there, as specified in that business plan for that creepy company Valor Retreat at High Rock. Difficulty obtaining and holding a job, increased isolation and further difficulties, etc. In conclusion, this image perfectly portrays the commonly held toxic stereotype that veterans have no control over their emotions. However, this could not be farther from the truth since the jobs in the military require a masterful command over one's emotions. In effect, this stereotype is a confession of the public at large that they themselves lack control over their own emotion as seen with all the rioting and hysteria going on right now. <laughs> you can imagine what that particular English teacher who was carrying out a psychological operation had an issue with there. I'm sure that last statement particularly vexed her. <laughs> Next, this map portraying some of the other stereotypes that exist across the United States culture draws a literal map of how people from different states are, are viewed. While working in a diverse culture like the military, these stereotypes rear their ugly heads and are found to be wanting. As the saying goes in the Marine Corps, there is only one color in the Marine Corps, and that is green. This saying, used in many different ways in the Marine Corps culture, essentially means leave your bias at the door. However, in the majority of places in the United States, these stereotypes are commonly held and go unchallenged. This draws a par parallel to the stereotypes that civilians hold in regard to military veterans and service members. Furthermore, stereotypes are so ingrained in our culture and left unchallenged, they fester and spread to many different areas. This image helps to draw some context and challenge a viewer to think of other stereotypes that exist or they themselves might hold. Simply stating that veterans are looked at in a stereotypical and unfaithful way does nothing without the broader context of stereotypes as a whole. Subsequently, it is important to think about how stereotypes have shaped and in some ways damaged our culture. This raises the question, are these stereotypes true? And if not, how did they come about? And uh, <laughs> this one was particularly fun to put in there. This image generates emotions in an American viewer and sometimes in a foreign one. These emotions are the same ones that meet a person when they are traveling or going somewhere unfamiliar. Now more than ever, North Americans see the world through a lens of stereotypes. These stereotypes, most often negative, generate fear and apprehension. As such, we tend to see the worst in people and are distrustful of strangers. However, this is a self-fulfilling situation because we will treat people poorly because of our preconceived notions. In response, we will also be treated poorly, which justifies our preconceived notions. Subsequently, a negative cycle ensues that is nearly impossible to extricate oneself from. This image in particular portrays an individual, likely a man, with a darker complexion and a traveling suitcase standing in front of the common stereotypes of America that are pushed by the media nowadays. The fact that this image generates the emotions of fear, distrust, and apprehension proves that there is an evil and dangerous stereotype circulating through our society. As an explanation, this image would likely not conjure any emotions in someone from Mongolia or Tibet. However, they would likely immediately identify this image with America, and that is not good. The same emotions are generated because of the propaganda surrounding veterans. Now, more than ever, the worst thing you can be is a straight white or straight male veteran with a light, lighter complexion. Stereotypes will immediately arise and people will judge you for these. Conversely, an individual within this skin tone will go, go out to the world and assume that others will attribute these stereotypes to them and judge them negatively as a consequence. Thus, the individual will live life defensively and create a nightmarish world for themselves. This can be said of any individual regardless of complexion because of all the distrust that has been embedded in our culture. What is the cause of all this hysteria and delirium and why is it being generated? 
Next, the iconic image above showing Christopher Dorner, the media-styled cop killer cop, is shown wearing his military uniform. The story, although old, helps to show the stereotypes against the police force and for our purposes, the military. Ingrained over years by the media, the stereotypes of volatile and violent military has severely damaged the public viewpoint on military members. This happens because whenever a service member or veteran commits a crime, they are broadcast across the airwaves, not as a troubled individual, but as a veteran or service member. Their association with the service is highlighted above all else, and this case is perfect. Well, if perfect, in this regard, the alleged killer was a police officer, and yet he was and is continuously shown by the media wearing his military fatigues. There are likely other pictures that could be used for the individual, but this one was chosen. Why? Perhaps there is an effort to dehumanize and destroy the image of veterans and service members? The likely cause would be a carryover of anti-military sentiment from the Vietnam era. These are questions that must be asked if the cycle of hatred, distrust, and social engineering is ever going to stop. The same goes in the Marine Corps during the endless safety briefs that take place on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. If you commit a crime and end up in the newspaper, it will not be you that commits the crime, but it will be a Marine. Last in this particular assignment, this image provides a viewpoint of the emotional and dramatic stereotypes surrounding PTSD. This shows that the person is, quote, suffering. This has nothing to do with what PTSD is and what can be done to resolve PTSD as an issue in the first place. This does nothing except separate perspective from reality and provide a false view of what an individual with PTSD actually goes through. When someone who, is a, who actually has PTSD will recognize patronization and disrespect for independent capability in this image, others will see an opportunity that they can exploit using others' false opinions. These dramatizations, while they make people pay attention, also are very damaging and solve absolutely nothing. While individuals suffering from PTSD can get treatment, they will continuously have trouble talking to others about their experiences. This is because public views PTSD as something that causes people to be weak. Therefore, individuals that are or have suffered from PTSD will not tell anyone else about it because they do not want to be coddled or treated like a child. This image is more than anything depicting depression, which is not the same thing as PTSD. Depression is also something that people will not broadcast when they're suffering from it, as this will lead to feelings of embarrassment and distrust. Meanwhile, the individual might believe that the person doesn't actually care about the case of depression, but rather is simply handling the situation. On the other hand, the people that broadcast their supposed issues often do not actually have any real problems, but rather are seeking attention. Oftentimes, people with actual issues will broadcast them for attention-seeking and often self-identify with their disabilities, as can be seen in the so-called empowering media coverage of, these, of such individuals. Attention-seeking is not bad in and of itself. However, when this behavior is at the expense of others, it is evil and should be confronted. Unfortunately, most people are afraid to confront this because of the backlash for not believing someone when they say that they have a disorder. This is very prevalent in the military because something called malingering is a crime punishable under the UCMJ. Malingering is when an individual lies. Well, there, that last part cut off. But to come to our next stage of the operation where now as we've seen before public opinion has been turned against veterans but in a way that it makes it look like it's actually for them now they have to incentivize disability and this is done for a variety of reasons but mainly for the third stage so let's focus on the second right now this is from a paper from 2013 the Osage Nation Tax Commission is located at blah blah blah. Three car tax for disabled veterans and Osages 65 years and older. The Osage Nation Tax Commission is now offering elder tags for Osages 65 years and older. The law sponsored by Congresswoman Maria Whitehorn set up the program to waive annual registration tax, title fee, and the cost of non-personalized license plate for disabled veterans and Osage elders. So here they're lumping things together just like with so-called first responders and combat veterans are on the same level and anybody else who's not in those they get pushed pushed away right and then eventually they're going to remove so-called combat veterans and have first responders as the important element because that's easier to control for foreign uh, enemy investment purposes principal chief john red eagle signed the bill into law on april 9th we are not offering elder tags and are happy to assist with any questions or information people may need, said Kim Soliano, office coordinator. The law specifies that up to two tags will be granted per disabled veteran or Osage senior and only passenger vehicles and farm trucks qualify. 
the Osage Tax Commission, will recognize only those disabled veterans that are registered with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs as disabled. For more information, blah, blah, blah. So there, they are incentivizing disability among veterans. But not just disability, registration as disability. That's very important. Here, this takes us to the last component which is actually technically part of the second one as well. 38 USC, Title 38, Veterans Benefits, Part 6, Acquisition and Disposition of Property. Chapter 85, Disposition of Deceased Veterans, Personal Property, Subchapter 1, Property Left on Department Facility. Section 8501, Vesting of Property Left by Dissidents. Personal property left by any dissident upon premises used as a department facility, which premises are subject to the exclusive legislative jurisdiction of the United States and are within the exterior boundaries of any state or dependency of the United States, shall vest and be disposed of as provided in this subchapter, except that, one, if such person died leaving a last will and testament probated under the laws of the place of such person's domicile, or under the laws of the state or dependency of the United States within the exterior boundaries of which such premises or part thereof may be the personal property of such dissident situated upon such premises shall vest the person or persons entitled thereto under the provisions of such last will and testament. Now, they could forge testaments and wills and all that, right? And I'm sure that they do that all the time. But if you bear with this, they have a different section that removes this problem entirely and makes it so that they can take property even with this clause there in the U.S. Code. Two, if such person died leaving any such property not disposed of by a last will and testament probated in accord with the provisions of paragraph one, such property shall vest in the persons entitled to take such property by inheritance under and upon the conditions provided by the law of the dissident's domicile. This paragraph should not apply to property to which the United States is entitled except where such title is divested out of the United States. Isn't that confusing? That last section is very important. I'll read it again. This paragraph shall not apply to property to which the United States is entitled. What forms entitlement to the United States of property? Except where such title is divested out of the United States. So, if such title is divested out of the United States, does this paragraph apply? Very convoluted. But that paragraph relates to other sections that essentially remove the whole need for such an issue as heirs and wills and next of kin, right? That big problem that they have. Nope, they figured that one out too. Last part of this section is any officer or employee of the United States in possession of any such property may deliver same to the executor or the administrator, which will annex who shall have qualified in either jurisdiction as provided at subsection A1, or if none, such then to the domiciliary administrator or to any other qualified administrator who shall demand such property, when delivery shall have been made to any such executor or administrator in accordance with the subsection, neither the United States nor officer or employee thereof shall be liable therefore. So here in this section, you have a indemnification clause so that they can violate this whole section and they're indemnified from that violation. That's convoluted, but it gets worse. Now, interestingly enough, there's a whole different section with the same title, Vesting of Property Left by Dissidents. This is also in Title 38, Part 6, Subchapter 85. Well, subject or, or Chapter 85. So that's a deviation from the last part, which was in a different chapter. Disposition of deceased veterans' personal property, subchapter 2, death while patient of department facility, section 8520, vesting of property left by decedents. A. Whenever any veteran admitted as a veteran or a dependent or survivor of a veteran receiving care under the penultimate sentence of section 1781B of this title, shall die while a member or patient in any facility or any hospital while being furnished care or treatment therein by the department and shall not leave any surviving spouse next to kin or heirs entitled under the laws of dissidents and domicile to the dissidents personal property as to which such person dies intestate 
All such property, including money and choses in action, owned by such person at the time of death and not disposed of by will or otherwise, shall immediately vest in and become the property of the United States as trustee for the sole use and benefit of the general post fund. Here and after this subchapter referred to as the fund, a trust fund prescribed in section 1321A45 of Title 31. The provisions of subsection A are conditions precedent to the initial and also the further furnishing of care or treatment by the department in a facility or hospital. The acceptance and the continued acceptance of care or treatment by any veteran admitted as a veteran to the department, facility, or hospital shall constitute an acceptance of the provisions and conditions of the subchapter and have the effect of an assignment. Effective at such person's death, such assets in accordance with and subject to the provisions of the subchapter and regulations issued in accordance with the subchapter. So you have two titles, same name, same under the same title, I, I guess you would say you have two sections under the same title with the same name, but they're different sections. And they're basically listing out the same things. So why the redundancy? These are all tricks that they can use so that if somebody were to press a claim, say a descendant of the dissident, that's not confusing. Well, they would read this and think, oh, I have a case here. And then they would find out that one section uh, would, of course, through its redundancy, negate the other section, and then also that other section has a uh, Im immunity or a um, protective clause in it where they can, in fact, violate these sections and get away with it, and that's how their system works. But it still gets worse. Under the same title, Part 6, Chapter 85, Subchapter 2, we have subsection 8524, Disposal of Remaining Assets. The remainder of such assets or their proceeds shall become assets of the United States as a trustee for the fund and disposed of in accordance with the subchapter. If there is administration upon the dis dissident's estate, uh, estate, such assets, other than money upon claim, there, therefore, within the time required by law, shall be delivered by the administrator of the estate to the secretary or the secretary's authorized re representative as upon final distribution. And upon the same claim, there shall be paid to the treasurer of the United States for credit to the fund any such money available for final distribution. In the absence of administration, any money chosen in action or other property of the deceased veteran held by any person shall be paid or transferred to the secretary upon demand by the secretary or the secretary's duly authorized representative who shall deliver itemized receipt, therefore. Okay, so let's say that that person that is holding this property is in fact an heir, a descendant, or next of kin, or otherwise a vested party, invested party. Well, under this section, they would get a demand letter for all of that property. And most people, I expect, would deliver it up. In continuation, such payment or transfer shall constitute a complete acquittance of the transfer with respect to any claims by any administrator, creditor, or next of kin of such descendant. And there you get the kicker. That last sentence indemnifies anybody who is taking property and delivering it to somebody else. So they can't be held accountable. It's essentially asset laundering. Right? It, they have all these nice little words in here, but in the end they get their stuff and it gets lost in the system and you can't do anything about it because in the codes themselves those that did the transfers are indemnified from any repercussions and if there's an issue with it the judges will always rule in the favor of the phony corporate government but it still gets worse subsection 8523 disbursements from the fund Disbursements from the fund shall be made by the Division of Disbursements, Treasury Department. Upon the order and within the discretion of the Secretary for the benefit of members and patients while being supplied care treatment by the Department in any facility or hospital. So it's for the benefit of members and patients. Members comes before patients in precedent. That could not have been an accident. The authority contained in the preceding sentence is not limited to facilities or hospitals under direct administrative control of the department. Not limited to facilities or hospitals. Facilities coming first under direct administrative control of the department. So that means even those areas that are not under their, quote, direct administrative control 
are in fact bound by this code as well. Possibly leads to all the other subsequent codes in addition. Either way, they're claiming control over areas that they don't directly control. And it's just listing facilities. Somebody's house could be listed as a facility, as an example. Somebody's quote-unquote private home, of which we don't own anything and we're supposed to be happy about it. We're finding that out pretty well today with the uh, super, apparently rogue, local so-called governments, which are going around and uh, trespassing on people's property, doing basically whatever they want. Because their trespass laws are only applied to, they don't go both ways, it's a one-way street. So you do what we tell you, and we don't have to follow any of the stuff that we tell, tell you to do, because we're foreign occupiers, and you are our slaves, basically. Subjects, you know. Our occupied uh, territory. They shall be paid out of the assets of the dissident so far as may be the valid claims of creditors against the dissident's estate that would be legally payable, therefore, from the absence of the subchapter and without the benefit of any exemption statute, and which may be presented to the department with one year from the date of death, or within the time to the person and the manner required by law, by the law of the state wherein administration, if any, is had upon the estate of the deceased veteran. Now, notice this section is delineating law of the state. That's also very important for the next parts that we're going to look at. And also the proper expenses and costs of administration, if any. If the dissident's estate is insolvent and distribution to creditors shall be in accordance with the laws of the dissident's domicile, and the preferences and priorities prescribed thereby shall govern subject to any applicable law of the United States. Notice it states subject to any applicable law of the United States. Now we have this part, subsection 8521. Presumption of contract for disposition of personality. 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 Don't know if that's misspelled or if that's a word that we don't really use anymore, but I assume that would mean a personal effect. In fact, of death of a veteran admitted as such, or a dependent or survivor of a veteran receiving care under the penultimate sentence of section 1781b of this title in a facility or hospital while being furnished care or treatment therein by the department leaving no spouse next to kin or heirs shall give rise to a conclusive presumption of a valid contract for the disposition in accordance with this subchapter but subject to its conditions of all property described in section 8520 of this title owned by said decedent at death and as to which such person dies intestate. So that is a regurgitation of the same thing that we read in, I think, section subsection 8520. But them linking these things together means that most of this is in, invalidated by other sections that they wrote into those other sections for the purpose of specifically circumnavigating their own apparent laws. Next, we have subsection 8522, sale of assets accruing to the fund. Any assets heretofore or hereafter accruing to the benefit of the fund other than money, but including jewelry and other personal effects, may be sold at the times and places and in the manner prescribed by regulations issued by the Secretary. Upon receipt of the purchase price, the Secretary is authorized to deliver at the place of sale said property sold, and upon request to execute and deliver appropriate assignments or other conveyances thereof in the name of the United States, which shall pass to the purchaser such title as decedent had at date of death. This, of course, relates to their laundering of the stolen property. The net proceeds after paying any proper sales expenses as determined by the Secretary shall forthwith be paid to the Treasurer of the United States to the credit of the fund, and may be dispersed as are other monies in the fund by the Division of Disbursements, Treasury Department, upon order of said Secretary. Articles of personal adornment, which are obviously of sentimental value, shall be retained and not sold or otherwise disposed of until the expiration of five years from the date of death of the veteran, without a claim therefore, unless, for sanitary or other proper reasons, it be deemed unsafe to retain the same, in which event they may be destroyed forthwith. Any other articles coming into possession of the Secretary or the Secretary's representatives by, or representative by virtue of this subchapter, which under regulations promulgated by the Secretary, are determined to be unsaleable, which may be destroyed forthwith or at the time prescribed by regulations, or may be used for the purposes for which disbursements might properly be made from the fund, or if not usable, otherwise disposed of in accordance with regulations. And the final section, which is the real interesting one, 
Subsection 8508, Relinquishment of Federal Jurisdiction. Subject to the provisions of the subchapter and to the extent necessary to effectuate the purposes of the subchapter, there is hereby relinquished to the respective state or dependency of the United States such jurisdiction pertaining to the administration of states of dissidence as may have been ceded to the United States by said state or dependency of the United States respecting the federal reservation on which is situated any department facility, while such facility is operated by the department. Such jurisdiction with respect to any such property on any such reservation to be to the same extent as if such premises had not been ceded to the United States, nothing in this section shall be construed to deprive any state or dependency of the United States of any jurisdiction which it nor ha now has, nor to give any state possession or dependency of the, the United States authority over any federal official as such on such premises or otherwise. So they're basically, all of these Department of Veterans Affairs facilities are not actually run by a centralized so-called federal entity they are, in fact, more localized than that. They are being run by the states. And so that means you'll have a discrepancy when you transfer states, transfer school, transfer anywhere, and you are operating under these supposed benefit programs.